Spoilers. It's been two years since we took a look at Kiyoshi Kurosawa's charming but somewhat polarizing first foray into the horror genre, Sweet Home. As we discussed in that video, the film's production had long been rumored to have been riddled with creative clashes between Kurosawa and producer Juzo Itami. There's no saying for certain, but given how Sweet Home has been written off more or less entirely by both Kurosawa and production distributor Toho as a popcorn flick of its era, it's not a stretch to imagine the now world-renowned director is less than thrilled to look back on the film. This is long overdue, but we thought that today we ought to come back to Kurosawa and look at a later project of his, what many might consider his true introduction into the horror genre, as well as the international film scene. Okay, horror might be overstepping a little here. I understand that almost everyone will list this film as horror. It would more accurately be called a suspense or a thriller. This is kind of a personal gripe, but it gets to me when I'm looking for something to watch, being someone who really likes tense suspense and psychological thrillers, and I have to look in the horror category instead. Here, movies like today's subject are lumped alongside their diametric opposites in terms of tone, subject, and subtlety. Examples of this include The Midnight Meat Train or masterpieces like Clown, which deserve to be in a category all their own. What I'm getting at here is that Cure was talked up as a horror film, but when we actually got to viewing it, we realized that it's more akin to something like Seven rather than something like Clown. Which, I might add, are both listed as drama on Google search, so... <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to convey is that horror as a category can be misleading. It can include spoopy ghosts, bloody scenes, and nail-biting moments that can exist all together or separately and still be considered part of the same genre. Fair point, and duly noted. I was honestly just as taken aback by this. As someone who went on to direct more horrific horror films, and as someone who today is known largely as a horror director, it was surprising to find that Kiyoshi Kurosawa's first piece, as well as the film that many still claim to be his magnum opus, completely lacked any monsters, jump scares, supernatural happenings, and so on. Disclaimer, we understand that none of this is required to qualify a film as horror, but we're comparing it to Sweet Home here. Nope, Cure is in fact a police drama and a murder mystery concerned with questions of psychological control and torment. Cure, which won a slew of awards, mostly for acting, throughout 1998 and 1999, was one of the forerunners to the international Japanese horror boom of the early 2000s. Released in 1997, the film saw numerous festival screenings and a release in France before finally reaching our shores in 2001 right alongside other heavy hitters of the era. The film has often been compared to Suicide Club and its sequel Noriko's Dinner Table, but we'll be avoiding these comparisons throughout the video. In all honesty, we think these lines are drawn between the properties by virtue of their release dates, and the fact that they treat contemporary social problems as a virus or a disease. However, as eagle-eyed viewers will note, Cure actually came out four years prior to Suicide Club meaning that the false parallel is likely drawn mostly by their similar release date in the United States. Kira has no doubt been influential, however. It's not only skyrocketed Kurosawa to domestic and international acclaim after nearly a decade of working mostly on television films, Kira also set a pretty high bar in terms of quality and subtext for Japanese horror and thriller films for the decade to come. As my partner's tirade may have clued you in before, though, this is not a horror film in the proper sense. It's much more psychological. So while the film might not have had much bearing on the Ring series or the Juan series, it certainly left a mark still felt to this day given how much it pushed Kurosawa into the spotlight at home and abroad. We encourage anyone interested in this genre or Kurosawa's works at large to check out the film. Otherwise, we're going to start delving into what makes Cure so damn effective. The film follows Kenichi Takabe, played by Koji Yakusho of Eureka fame. Takabe is a detective on the hunt for a killer, or perhaps multiple killers. You see, we join Takabe and company in media res, as they're midway through their investigation. A number of murder victims have shown up, all bearing the same fatal wound, an X on the neck. Yet in all cases, the murderer has been apprehended. The problem is that the police cannot draw any connections between the numerous perpetrators as of yet leading Takabe to grow disenchanted and frustrated with the case. A break comes when the police find a man, Mamiya, 
who serves as this elusive connection between the perpetrators. As it turns out, each of the killers ran across Mamiya just prior to killing someone. The situation becomes further complicated when Mamiya presents no identification, no surname, and no memory, exhibiting severe amnesia. From here, the true game of cat and mouse begins. Takabe is convinced that he has the right man with Mamiya, while Mamiya offers up no further leads. Takabe, in turn, has to seek out who this enigmatic man might actually be, and it's at this point that we have to run the spoiler warning. We played it up top thanks to our cat Chester, but from here on out we're going to be delving pretty deep into spoiler territory, so don't say we didn't warn you. We can't really analyze Kira properly without talking about the climax, so let's get into that. As it turns out, Mamiya may have been lying about his amnesia, effectively acting superbly without ever allowing cracks to show in his mask. Then again, was he acting? We're led to believe once Takabe uncovers evidence of Mamiya's past as a student of psychology interested in experimentation, that Mamiya may have done something to himself in order to rid himself of his ego, and in order to exert force over others. This is most clearly hinted at through Mamiya's student-aged obsession with Franz Mesmer, from whose name the term mesmerism is derived. Mesmer was an 18th century doctor who has remained prominent to this day thanks to his development of the idea of animal magnetism. More commonly called mesmerism, animal magnetism deals with a supposed unseen force moving throughout the universe and all living beings. Mesmer believed that by manipulating the flow of this power, a mesmerist, also called a magnetizer, could influence a being. Primarily, Mesmer studied animal magnetism in order to seek cures for human ailments. He worked with the hysteria patients, the blind, and other afflicted people to try and alleviate their symptoms using his new method, which initially utilized actual magnets. Even within his lifetime, Franz Mesmer was a controversial figure. Repeatedly, he came up against controversy from the medical and scientific establishments of Europe, being called a buffoon and a quack who was preying on the goodwill and hope of the afflicted. However, his methods were convincing enough for some to carry on his work even into the present day. What's more, a certain more common term, hypnotism, sprang not from Mesmer's work, but from a response to it. In 1851, James Braid, a surgeon, wrote concerning animal magnetism. Braid commented that without the help of Mesmer, living creatures can fall under the spell of hypnotism, a term he made up for the occasion to describe an offset of one's natural flow by artificial contrivance, as he put it. Getting back to the film, it's important to understand this background if we hope to understand what's going on with Mamiya, and by extension his relationship with Takabe. Mamiya studied mesmerism to such a degree that he discovered some new form of animal magnetism. Just like Mesmer, he was turned down by his university as having gone off the rails. Just like Mesmer, he fled the area and set up shop somewhere else, in this case his own apartment, rather than a whole other country as happened with Franz Mesmer. In this new environment, Mamiya learned to control the invisible force circulating all around and throughout us, becoming in effect a powerful 20th century mesmerist. As the more proper name of this profession, magnetism, implies, Mamiya began to act as a magnet. He became a conduit for the universe's energy, redirecting the flow of anyone around him. In effect, this means that his interactions with Takabe may not be him acting dumb for the sake of avoiding culpability in the murders. In fact, he is redirecting the energy present in Takabe and manipulating Takabe to do as Mamiya pleases. This begs the question then, is Mamiya truly practicing animal magnetism, or has he become a master hypnotist, acting as the artificial contrivance of which James Braid wrote in the 19th century? Kira as a film is obsessed with two things, memory and this invisible flow of universal energy. Peppered throughout the film we see the image of the elephant, a creature associated with its hardy memory. Elephants have been observed mourning the loss of family members years after their deaths, showing that they truly have a memory on par with, if not exceeding, that of humans in terms of endurance. Mamiya, of course, appears at first to be the opposite of this, barely being able to remember past five minutes prior. As we previously stated, however, this may all be a ruse on Mamiya's part. For all intents and purposes, he seems devoid of memory or emotion until the very last scene of the film, when he reveals that Takabe was playing along with his game the whole time. This leads to the question of the universal energy of animal magnetism. 
Takabe is something of a walking contradiction, not unlike Mamiya. He tries to remain righteous and moral as a police officer, yet he cannot allow himself to be bested by a seeming mental invalid like Mamiya. This draws out his rage as the film proceeds. His wife is sick, giving him a driving force to do well at his job whether to provide for her hospital bills in order to spend what time he has left with her, or simply to make her proud. Whether he is being dragged along by Mamiya's hypnotic suggestion, or he's looking for a reason to keep living, he pursues the perpetrator doggedly. It's practically torture to him, a cop so resolute in his worldview that he scolds others at a crime scene for cracking jokes at the expense of a victim. And yet Takabe seems by the end of the film to be lacking any agency. He truly seems to be controlled by Mamiya, implying that Mamiya has succeeded in his experiments. A psychologist explains at one point that someone who has a problem with killing would be willing to kill under hypnosis. Naturally, this is to explain how all of the killers throughout the film are culpable in their crimes, yet they can't explain why they did what they did. However, it also raises another point. It begs the question, how much of ourselves are we? If the force of the universe can be redirected with mesmerism or hypnotism, how much are we truly individuals? Mamiya seeks to break this mold by becoming the influencer. It's a very zen notion, but by emptying his body of a self, he both becomes one with the universe, able to influence it, and a more powerful entity. Thus, by being empty, he is actually being extremely selfish. At one point, Mamiya states, quote, My insides are outside. I can feel your insides, but I'm empty. End quote. Conversely, another character offers the critique that, quote, if he were trying to mimic Mesmer, he'd be a megalomaniac. End quote. This seeming contradiction likely explains why Mamiya is so obsessed with Takabe. Finally, amongst all the more or less empty people he has encountered leading more or less pointless lives, Mamiya has come across a truly righteous man. Takabe is his proving ground. All the others were easy to manipulate, but Takabe is both mentally and emotionally a fortress compared to them. At the close of the film, when Takabe confronts Mamiya as his true self and gloats at what he's accomplished through manipulating Takabe, the film leaves us with the lingering question of who truly won here. True, Takabe kills Mamiya, but the infestation planted by Mamiya has been allowed to fester and swell. There seem to be two interpretations here regarding the scene after Takabe kills Mamiya. We observe Takabe in a restaurant following Mamiya's death, where he encounters a waitress who seems poised to murder. The first conclusion here is that Takabe has been the carrier for Mamiya's spiritual disease all along, yet that he has been somehow immune. This makes sense when you consider that several of the perpetrators came into contact with Takabe prior to committing their crimes. On the other hand, this ending could be implying that Mamiya has found a way to continue redirecting the flow of the universe's energy following his death. Whether it's something supernatural or it implicates Takabe as Mamiya's carrier after their game of cat and mouse, the effect is the same. This could explain why Mamiya was so jovial to reveal his true self to Takabe in the prior scene. He was laughing at Takabe, knowing that he had already won and set in place a mechanism to continue his work following death. This ending, thanks to its inconclusive nature, is sure to frustrate some viewers, while it will drive others wild with speculation and applause. Cure is truly a mind-bender of a watch, a surprisingly deep commentary about society masquerading as a murder mystery thriller. And while we might not draw as strong of parallels as some between this film and Shion Sono's later two suicide films, we can draw one conclusion with confidence. In the age of social media, where we can so easily project whatever self we wish, taking time to pick and choose how we present the person known as us, Cure is more poignant than perhaps it ever has been.